First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Looks like you need a vacation. Enter the five-hour energy Where Will the Tide Take You sweepstakes. You could win a $10,000 dream beach vacation. Imagine jet setting off to a tropical paradise. Having fun in the sun or diving at a gorgeous reef. It's up to you. No purchase necessary. Go to 5hetide.com for official rules and to enter. That's 5hetide.com. Enter today. Ends June 30th, 2024. When I design a magic presentation, I try to start in the action or very close to it. 101 advice for writing stories, right? You don't start with background on all the characters and then only when you're all caught up do you start your story. You start with Indiana Jones being run down by a boulder. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, June Thomas. And I'm your other host, Kristen Meinzer. Kristen, it is such a blast to be talking with you today. You're one of my favorite podcast hosts. You just always are so much fun to chat with. But say, whose voice did we hear at the top of the show? That is Joshua J. He is a magician. He is fantastic. But he's not just a magician. He's also a writer, a speaker, and just an all-around creative guy. And why did you want to speak with Joshua? Well, I have to give credit where credit is due. Our former working guest, Margalit Fox, she's the obituary writer from the New York Times. Yes. Uh, she and I have stayed in touch since we had her on the show. And she uh-huh. said to me, your next guest has got to be Joshua J. He is just fantastic. He's going to be the best interview you ever had. And I said, <laughs> I don't think that's true. You're the best interview we ever had. And she said, no, <laughs> it is going to be Joshua J. And I said, Margalit, coming from you... That's high praise. So, yes, let's try to get him on the show. And surprise, he said yes. <laughs> well, that is definitely a tip to follow. You obviously did the right thing. I'm very excited to hear this interview, but uh, something tells me you have an extra segment exclusively for Slate Plus members. What will they hear? Of course we do. So Slate Plus members are going to hear about the difference between different kinds of magic, for example, close-up magic versus parlor magic. I didn't even know what these terms meant before I talked with Joshua. And they're also going to hear about the various magic styles from around the world, because it turns out there are differences in magic in different cultures. That sounds amazing. If you're a member of Slate Plus, you'll hear that at the end of the episode. And if you aren't, well, let me just say it's super easy to join. As a Slate Plus member, you get to hear extra segments on this show and others like Culture Gab Fest. You'll get bonus episodes of podcasts like Slow Burn. And of course, you will never hit a paywall on Slate.com. You'll also be supporting the work we do here on Working. To learn more, go to Slate.com slash Working Plus. All right, let's hear Kristen's conversation with Joshua J. Debit card users, listen up. You've worked hard for your money. Now it's time to make it work even harder for you. With Discover Cashback Debit, everyone can get cash back on everyday debit card purchases. That's right. Earn on things like gas, groceries, and even that midday latte. And to top it off, there are no fees. Period. Yep, that means you won't be charged fees on your checking account. This one is a no-brainer. Transaction eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashbackdebit. Discover Bank. Member FDIC. Joshua J., welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Joshua, as little kids, a lot of us 
find ourselves entranced with the idea of magic. I know I was very entranced as a little kid, but I, like most little kids, never got past those one or two card tricks. How old were you when you first became interested in magic? And what made you stick with it beyond me or all of the other little kids out there? Stubbornness is what made me stick with it, I guess. <laughs> um, I, like so many kids, my dad did a, a card trick for me when I was a little kid, seven years old, and he didn't tell me how it was done. Mm. And that, in a way, was the transformative thing because I went up to my room, I worked on it, I have tried to figure it out, I took out my deck of cards, I made charts, and I eventually figured out the trick. I reverse engineered the trick. And then I went downstairs and performed it for him. And it was that cycle of like being amazed by a trick and feeling astonishment, but then reverse engineering it. And it became like chess to try to figure it out. That scratched a different itch. And then the last one was performing it, being on the other side of the looking glass, looking out. And all three of those things combine for kind of the three feelings I love chasing, even now. And in terms of why I stuck with it, I mean, I, I have never done anything else. I have never had another job. I never had the, the job bartending in college or, uh, you know, moving stuff out of a van, you know, for extra pocket money. This is the only thing I've ever done. Well, how does it become the only thing you've ever done? Because when I, a non-magician, thinks about career paths, I think, you know, maybe you study how to be an electrician, you apprentice with an electrician, and then you become an electrician yourself. But I guess I don't really quite understand how you, starting from age seven, became the person who has only ever done magic in your life. How does that career trajectory work? So I went to school. I went to Ohio State University, and I majored in creative nonfiction. I knew writing would be important. You know, when I went to school, I thought about going to business school. I thought about getting a degree in, in theater. But I ended up getting my degree in creative nonfiction you know, to be a writer because magic is a kind of storytelling. It really, the parallels between magic and storytelling are, are numerous. And, you know, my particular path, I didn't have a manager or an agent that sort of blazed the path for me. It's always been a very personal, individual path. And I've just always pursued what interested me. And that leapfrog from one thing to the next to the next. I will say I got one big sort of surge, which was right out of school, my senior thesis was a magic book, a curriculum, a beginner's guide to magic. And I sold that as soon as I moved to New York. That put me on a lot of TV shows. I did a big book tour, which was one of my first tours. And that sort of opened all sorts of other doors. But yeah, I, I mean, I've never been motivated by what's the next career move. I've always just been motivated by what would be cool? What would be interesting to me? Was there a magician school that you ever attended, though? Was there anything along those lines? No, you know, creating magic for me has always been very personal about inventing the tricks. But, you know, many magicians, most magicians buy their tricks and perform it in their own personal way. But I create nearly everything that I do. So, Everything for me is a multi-year, multi-month process of dreaming up ideas and then performing those ideas on stage and refining them and evolving them. Well, let's talk a little bit about that process. Sure. How do you come up with these ideas and then how do you refine them and so on? So for one thing, I tend to be an effect-based creator. So there's two ways of approaching magic. You can either approach it by method or by effect. If you approach it by method, an example of that might be like, hey, look at this new technology. How can I use that for magic? Or, ooh, there's this move where it looks like the card goes in the deck, but it actually ends up in my pocket. How can I use that? That's method-based creating. What can we use this tool to do? Effect-based creating is the dreaming, right? It's going, what would be really interesting? What would be a cool trick? Wouldn't it be cool if I could get a card between the layers of a postcard? Oh, okay, that's cool. How do I do that? So that's, I tend to go from the dream. And then the way that I've had the most success is just chasing the narrative. So there are narratives in all of our lives passing us 
all the time. And I try to grab hold of the narratives that interest me most and pair them with tricks that, that feel compatible. So one example is that I teach magic to incarcerated magicians all over the world. I teach magic to people who are serving sentences in institutions, not just here, but abroad as well. And they have crazy constraints. Like they're allowed to have Gatorade bottles and pencils, but no pens. They're allowed to have playing cards, but the playing cards have to be on paper and not plastic. They're allowed to have this. They're not allowed, allowed to have that. And so I came up with this trick that I call balance that's become kind of a signature piece for me where I take all of these props and I tell the story of people in prison and, and doing magic and the difference it makes in their lives. And then I stack these objects up, all the objects they're allowed to have in their prison cells in an impossible way so that they're basically levitating. Another example is how my parents met. The kind of bedtime story I always heard is this crazy, almost Benjamin Button type story of, of so many weird things that had to happen in just the right sequence for my parents to meet. And they would have 30 seconds later, they'd have been coming out the door at different times, but all these things in their days both delayed them and allowed them to hit each other coming in and out of a doorway. And that became a trick called Trojan Deck, where I have a spectator shuffle a deck and I shuffle a deck, and then the cards end up matching. The whole deck matches card for card. And that felt like a really good pairing for two people meeting and falling in love. So there are all of these narratives. You know, as I sit here doing this interview with you, I'm in New York and Chelsea, right across from the largest blind center where people who are sightless go about their day. So every day when I'm going to the donut store and, and walking around, there are all sorts of people who lack eyesight crossing the street, going about their day. And some of them live in my building and I've talked to them and I realized one day none of these people will ever be able to see what I do because magic is a visual art form. But what would it look like if they could? What would it look like if they experienced magic? Well, I'd have to do magic for their mind, not their eyes. And that paved the way for a trick called out of sight, which became the trick that I fooled Penn and Teller with. So all of these tricks start from some interesting narrative perspective. Wow. So is your process of making magic, is a lot of it about writing things down? Absolutely. I have very complex... Uh, note-taking system in my phone now. I have notes for every project I'm thinking about, every project I've started, and so on. Does it also involve things like charts? And I, I'm just trying to imagine what your workspace looks like. Yeah, you know, the one thing that I will say from a project management perspective that I've found is helpful sounds quite negative, but I, I only mean it in the most positive way is basically... I'm a project junkie like so many people, but I do tend to finish what I start because what I do is I try to find ways to fall out of love with an idea. So, mm. you know, if I wake up and I'm super excited about a new trick or I'm super excited about a book idea or an article idea or a fun collaboration with a musician that I just met, you know, I'm so excited about all these things and I write them down and I hope to harness that enthusiasm. But what I do is I, I make myself sit on an idea and poke holes in it and find reasons that it's not great. Well, that's so similar to what I already did, or that's so-and-so already did that to a great degree. I don't think I, I bring anything new to this. And that's how most of the ideas fall away. But what happens is if I can come back in two months, three months to an idea and I can't figure out an idea not to do it, that's when I know I have to do it. If I can't fall out of love with the idea, then I go for it. And the other, the other thing that's been very helpful to me, and, and I had to have somebody else in my life point this out to me because I didn't know this about myself, is that I'm kind of always road testing ideas verbally. In other words, in my circle of friends, I'm always going, hey, so I've got this new trick idea. And what I'm going to do is that, da, 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 and I kind of walk them through it. And what I'm doing is like looking for their response. And if they don't give me a really great like, ooh, and how would you do that? And so what would happen next? You know, that, that shows me they're engaged. If it's like met with, oh, cool, well, I hope it works out. I know that they aren't grabbed yet. You know, And so in a way, I'm refining the elevator pitch of all of these ideas so that I can figure out what resonates with people. I can figure out the idea myself and go from there. And once you have those ideas, how long does it take you to turn that into an actual trick? 
That's a harder one to answer because there are tricks that take, that fall into place. I mean, there's a new thing that I've been doing around and I've just started performing it in my smaller shows that truly fell into place, I mean, in a matter of two months. And I can't believe it because from a structural standpoint, it's quite complex and there's a lot of original ideas in it and things that haven't been done in that way before. And it's the kind of thing that if I looked at this, I would say this would take me six months or a year or more. And in two months, it's it's like falling into place. That's the best case scenario. But contrast that with, I had the idea during COVID of borrowing a ring and making it appear like a finger ring and making it appear inside a flashlight. And the idea would be somebody would be in the audience shining my flashlight on stage and I would be doing shadow puppets, shadowography. And then I would take their ring and incorporate it somehow into the shadows. And then the shadow bird, for example, would eat the ring and it would end up inside the flashlight. I think that's a cool idea. It goes back to where it started. It's got this circular plot to it. But in order to even just test that idea out, I had to learn shadowography. So I started taking lessons and I learned that it's not something you can do with a shortcut. You can't just fake it. You have to learn this whole other art form that people dedicate their lives to. So truly, four years later, I still take lessons twice a week. I still practice between an hour and two hours every day just so that I can do this six-minute trick in my new show. And I was scared to death because I've taken big financial risks. I've taken big time investment risks, but I've never put hundreds of hours into a trick, not knowing whether it would work or not. But fortunately, this shadowography trick has worked. It's been good. Life is good with that one. It's amazing that you say two months was really fast for you to develop that trick. That makes me think, you know, in a good year, you must develop one or two tricks because they take so long to develop, right? You develop 20 tricks. I mean, I developed 20, 25 tricks, but 18 of them, 20 of them, end up on the cutting room floor. Is it hard to leave those babies behind? Does it feel like, oh no, what if I never come up with a good idea again? Do you ever have that fear when you are killing so many of your ideas? Yes, I do. But repression tends to help. <laughs> um, repressing it. I mean, I'll give you an example. I have a new show that is, you know, it's very new. It's less than a year old. It's less than... Uh, I think it's just about 60 60 to 70 performances in, which is young for a show. And this show started with two of the most original ideas that I've I've put on stage. One is, you know, it's actually an apparatus that was built for me and and it's right on point. My show's called Look Closer and these are all like look closer moments. I'm not wearing glasses. These aren't even my legs, that sort of thing. And then the next piece in the show is my take on a classic trick with a cup and a ball that that I have a totally original prompt for. And the tough part was both went over pretty well, pretty well. But after the shows, I always ask the people I trust, what was your favorite thing? What was your least favorite thing? And those two things never made anybody's favorites list. And... People always had gripes or like, well, I think it could be better if it was this. Not not just people going to enjoy the show, but people looking at the show critically. And what I realized was despite thousands of dollars, despite hundreds of hours, those two pieces were inessential. They were good, but not great. If you were grading them on a scale of one to 10 without bias, I think they fall somewhere in the six, seven category. And so I made the choice in the last week of shows to cut them out. And it was, you know, it was really giving up on on two big ideas. And the show was instantly tighter. It was instantly better. And it hurts. When I think about it, I think about, oh, should I have tried other things? Should I not have given up so fast? But we tried so many things. We tried so many things. So in the end, I think it was the right call. But yes, it stings and it hurts. And knowing when and why and how to cut things is, is always difficult. But I am positive that it's an important part of the creative process. We'll be back with more of Kristen's conversation with Joshua J.
This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we discuss the creative process and we offer creative advice. And we would love to answer listener questions. So please share your challenges and let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com. You can also send a voice memo to that address or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK and leave a message. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to follow Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to Kristen's conversation with Joshua J. I really love that you are actually trying to get feedback from other folks when you're in the midst of this. Not all of us deal with feedback well. Sometimes feedback can really sting. But in addition to getting feedback from others, are you also trying to objectively look at yourself by, let's say, filming yourself and then looking at the video afterwards? Are there other things you're doing to try and see how things are going? Yes, uh, there are. And, you know, I love the the drive of this podcast. This is the kind of, I read lots of books on this, and I think it is so fruitful and helpful to hear how various people handle their creative process and their path to improving and making their work. I am always weary of codifying it too much. You know what I mean? Like, I, I love this quote from Neil Gaiman, the author, who says, you never really learn to write a book. You only learn to write the book you're writing. And mm-hmm. that's so true. I mean, once a show has been running for five or six years and it's consistently where I want it to be, I, I you know, I'm so proud of it. I'm so confident in, in the material. And I think to myself, I could take the world on. And so then you start the next show <laughs> and you quickly realize that everything you did in the previous show won't apply here. Because if it does, you're just recreating the same you're hitting the same note as the previous show. So what you realize going through it is like, wow, this is going to be so different or what worked last time doesn't work this time or I have this new constraint that I put on myself. So you really are just figuring out what it's about with each one. And one of the things that I can chat about at this juncture, which I'm feeling with this new show, you know, you're talking to me at a very interesting time because I'm very much in the act of creation as this new show becomes whatever it is, is I'm, I'm at a point where I have realized truly in the last two weeks that the show I set out to make is not the show I've ended up with. In other words, I was so sure I was creating a show about a certain thing and, and approaching in a certain way with a certain format but when enough people repeat it back to me and when, you know, it's really even helpful when journalists like cover the show and they describe the show because you sort of go, that's what they left with? That's not at all what I set out. <laughs> but actually, if that's what they left with, 
that is what the show is to them. And so, wait a minute, should we lean into that? Should we accent that more? Should we fix it so that's not what they lean into? Well, so anyway, the show has become something quite different. You know, not totally different, but different than what I thought it was. And I've realized that where we've ended up is better than what I set out to do. It's it's a more noble, worthy direction for the show. And I would I have started describing it differently because... Clearly what people are taking from it is very different than what we set out to do. So it's so interesting, I guess, if I if I had to say it a little more succinctly, to find the essence of whatever it is you're working on. And to find that essence, it many times takes somebody else telling you. Is that hard, though, for you when you had this vision, you had this story, you had this narrative, you put your heart into something – and does it ever cross your mind, oh, they're just not getting it? What's wrong with them? Why don't they get what I'm trying to relay here? This is my heart. This is my creativity. Why are you not understanding? Does it ever feel like that? Yes, it feels like that most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's very frustrating, especially because, you know, we we all know it's it's the cliche to say it, but it's so true. It's very vulnerable to take notes from people. And I'm in a in a point in my show where I'm taking notes from people every night. So you have people you respect come and they tell you what they liked and they try to sandwich it with compliments. But of course, you're really just listening to the critical parts. And when they when they don't get what you're trying to do or they don't get the purpose of a piece or when they complain about something and I'm going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, what about, what about, what about? It's very frustrating because in a sense – no rebuttal matters at all because if they felt that way, something wasn't coming through. On the other hand, you have to hear everybody's criticism, but you only listen to the parts that you you want to address. And so knowing where that line is is endlessly complex. But I'm a big believer in building consensus. One of my friends and creative collaborators believes that any kind of audience involvement is the antithesis of art. Like he would never allow an audience to shape his work. He would never go by their reactions in shaping his work. And I think that's like a really noble, misguided approach. I don't think you can work in total isolation. I know that lots of people feel that way. They're painting, they're writing, whatever it is that the audience plays no role. They want to get what's inside out and that's what it is. But I don't know. I think that the the beholder share is wildly important to the whole. Mm-hmm. So I've often heard the adage that a magician never shares their tricks, right? We, we've all heard that adage, right? But in a lot of cases, you have. You've taught magic. You've written books on how to do magic yourself. What made you decide to be one of the magicians who actually spills the beans and how do other magicians feel about the fact that you're sharing all these secrets? I think that you're right. The old ad- uh, adage is that magician never reveals his secrets, mm-hmm. but actually that's not strictly true. Magicians have a wonderful community. They've always had a really robust inner craft, and um, I think it's one of the reasons magic is so great is because for the most part, magicians are quite, they, they have a sharing spirit, they they help each other out when possible and, you know, just exceptions to these rules. But um, there are more books published on magic than stand-up comedy and most other performing arts, even though those other performing arts dwarf the size of, of magic. Um, and that's because magicians do share their secrets and their philosophies and their techniques with other magicians. So, yeah, I have traveled the world lecturing and going to conventions, magic conferences, magic galas, magic um, festivals. We run our own, my business partner and I, we run several conventions and retreats and, and festival type things. And it's great. It's really great. And, um, you know, as long as you're aiming these at magicians, it's not considered exposure, right? It's considered teaching. Mm. Well, since we're talking about spilling secrets, are there any common tricks or tactics that magicians enlist that you can share with our listeners? I, I know you said most of the talks you're giving are targeted at other magicians, but are there certain things that, you know, are just part of the craft of magic that lay people like me might not understand or know about? Yes and no. I mean, coming back to something that we covered earlier, 
I think that there are numerous parallels between magic and storytelling. And for the most part, you can cross-pollinate those things. There are a few that I find that are in conflict with each other. But for example, when I design a magic presentation, I try to start in the action or very close to it. And this is 101 advice for screenwriting and for writing stories, right? You don't start with background on all the (laughs) characters and then only when you're all caught up do you kick in and start your story. You start with Indiana Jones being run down by a boulder. You start with somebody screaming at the main character. You start with the main character losing his pocket watch and it sets you on this adventure. Whatever it is, start close to the action. And that's always so important. Another great thing is is how to fit in exposition. You know, there's so much in a magic trick that's necessary information, like instructions. Just like in any story, there's all this background stuff. And everybody's first instinct is to sort of put all the exposition first and then do the magic. But you can often put the exposition on top of the magic in the same way that you can reveal all of these background things as you are telling the story, intertwine, intermix it with the magic. So that's also something I work on with magic students. And, you know, they're (sighs) killing your babies is a big one. (laughs) Um, Where to end? You know, tricks don't always have finite endings. It's like, well, I could do this and I could do this. But knowing how to end a magic trick is very similar to the difficult process of knowing where to end a short story. You know, I watched several of your talks in preparation for talking with you today. And one thing that you brought up more than once is something called mental misdirection. Can you explain Mm -hmm. what that is? Sure. There are two kinds of misdirection. In magic, there's physical misdirection and mental misdirection. So physical misdirection is you're talking and all of a sudden there's a big explosion on one side of the stage or a dancer comes and does a twirl on one side of the stage or I get you to look at something so that you look away from it. That's physical misdirection. You are physically directing somebody's attention away from what you wish to hide. Mental misdirection is doing the exact same thing but in your mind. So, for example, if I ask you a question, Kristen, whatever that question is, you're now on defense, right? You're answering my question. Oh, what's that beautiful frame behind you? Is is there a story behind that piece of art? (laughs) Well, now you're answering my question. Your mind, if not your eyes as well, are focused on whatever it is that I'm asking, and you're not looking at my hands, which are beneath the table right now, right? If I ask you, I would like you to think of any color, any color you wish— Now you're doing something, you're occupied. And when you're thinking of that color, you aren't looking at the box of cards that's on the table that my hand is on. You aren't looking at the shoes on my feet. So that's the difference between physical and mental misdirection, if that helps you. I want to talk about your company, Vanishing Ink Magic, Mm -hmm. which you founded in 2008. You manufacture and sell props for magicians. It's one of the largest magic shops in the world. And I can't help but wonder, since it's so big, do you ever worry about too many magicians essentially starting to look like copies of you? I don't worry about that because, as I said, I made the artistic decision years ago that I would always come up with original stuff. So that's one thing I never have to worry about. Um, We've We've sort of grown into one of the biggest companies in magic and distributors of magic in the world, which is a big responsibility. You know, when we put a trick out that becomes a hit trick, it really kind of changes the landscape of of how it looks. You know, these trends you see in magic and all of a sudden everybody's doing a trick that looks like the one we put out. Um, It's a big responsibility. And um, but it's great. You know, I get to work with my best friend and we have a great team full of our other friends and we put on conferences all over the world. I'm about to leave for uh, Egypt and do a Nile cruise with, with 60 other magicians and we'll be taking our magic with us. It's, it's such a fun thing to be able to do. Oh, I love your sense of sharing and collaboration. It, it, It feels like the way you talk about magic isn't something that you're gatekeeping. It's that you're spreading the joy and that you're sharing it with other people. I'm curious in your mind is magic an art, a craft? Is it a community? Is it science? How would you describe it? I'd describe it as a craft. 
You know, magicians have spent truly hundreds of thousands of words. I would say one of the magician's favorite pastimes is arguing about whether magic is an art or not. And that always struck me as such a weirdly pretentious, useless, weirdly framed debate because skateboarding can be art. Collecting trash can be art. Sleeping can be art. Anything can be art if it's framed as art and done at an exceptional, interesting level. So my understanding at this point is I believe magic is a craft. It's something that, like other crafts, you work at, you improve, you lay a foundation of skills, and magic, like anything else, can be elevated from craft to art when it's done in a truly artistic way. So I don't believe that magic can be art, but I think magicians can be artists. There's a great quote from one of my favorite magicians, Darwin Ortiz, and I'll probably butcher it, but it goes something like, magicians worry about whether magic is an art or a craft. If you focus on the craft part, the art part takes care of itself. Something like that, which is a lovely way of looking at it. If you can just focus on being great, getting the fundamentals correct, getting everything as great as it can be, the art part just tends to wash over you and happen. Oh, that's beautiful. Joshua J., thank you so much for joining us today. This has been fantastic. Oh, Kristen, thank you so much for having me on. I, I love the pursuit of this podcast and I'm honored to chat with you. Up next, Kristen and I will discuss killing your darlings and learning from reverse engineering other people's work. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Kristen, that was amazing. <laughs> I always love hearing conversations with people who are obsessed with their field and are consequently like just full of insights about it. I'm sure we've both come across people like this in our professional careers. I will note that political journalists are the most likely people to be consumed by their beat. Most of the ones that I know would happily devote every hour of their lives to studying the minutiae of politics. But Joshua seems to have turned his obsession with magic into a really fruitful portfolio career. And, well, I really want to check out his work. I also loved his commitment to actively trying to find ways to fall out of love with his fresh new ideas. He pokes them, he worries at them, and only the ones that survive that process go forward. Tell me the truth, Kristen. Do you do this? I know <laughs> that what Joshua describes is probably the right approach, but I feel like I'm constantly trying to protect my precious ideas rather than subjecting them to a rigorous interrogation, as I probably should. <laughs> well, June, this is one way that you and I are very similar. <laughs> ah, I have a lot of ideas, and I tend to think they all have great potential, which means I'll sometimes march them out into the world with maybe a little too much gusto, only to hear from others, from co-workers, from bosses, from friends, from my partner, you know, maybe that's not your best idea, Kristen. And <laughs> when that happens, my instinct is always to protect the idea rather than do what Joshua does. And frankly, yeah. I could probably stand to be a little bit more like Joshua. That being said, though, I am not sure if his approach makes sense for everybody, particularly young women whose ideas tend to be dismissed, mm. even as their male colleagues will present the same ideas and be praised for them. So I, I would say, you know, do a little bit of what Josh is saying, but be aware of the context in which you're doing it, because it may not always be the right thing to do. Kristen, that is a fantastic point. Yes, please keep that in mind. 
But this winnowing is obviously really central to Joshua's creative process. He also talked about giving up on two tricks that he had spent a lot of time and money developing for his recent show because they just weren't having the impact he wanted. Obviously, in a piece of performance, you get to hear the audience reaction as well as getting feedback from trusted sources to help you decide if something's working. And I'm sure he's right that the show was better when he jettisoned those good but not great tricks. But I know I find it so hard to just cut something that I have devoted time and effort and deep thought to. How do you cope with that? Have you developed any strategies for killing your darlings or, as former working host Ruman Alam put it so beautifully, beheading your swans? Oh, that is a brutal way to put it, Ruman. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, gosh, I for me, it, it's not easy, but I do have a little system to help me cope with it. Mm. First, I have a whole folder of just half finished books, books that Whoa. I have started to write, and I've made it a third of the way through, maybe a half of the way through. And so they're not exactly killed. I call them in purgatory. It's book purgatory, where these uh. partially finished books are that I've written. And for me, that feels better than killing them or God beheading them. <laughs> <laughs> I also have a running document that is many pages long of just ideas for other books, other podcasts, other projects. And knowing that I have that document and you know, mm. adding to it regularly, that helps me to be more at peace with those projects in purgatory. Wow. I, I think also now I'm aware that, you know, I'm just finishing a book and there were things that got cut after I'd put quite a lot of work into them and they were right to be cut. So it wasn't like I was, you know, struggling with that. But I knew somehow that I would be able to use them. I could use them in newsletters. I could use them. You know, you always have to do these little bits of writing. You know, there's always just something that you, you want to share with people. And so they're never really dead. They're always just maybe lying, as you say, in purgatory. So that, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, I love that Joshua's first exposure to magic, a card trick his father showed him, led him to reverse engineer the trick, figure it out, and then perform it for his dad. On working, we often talk about doing something similar with books or sentences or stories we admire, breaking them down in an attempt to see how the author did it, so we can then try to create some version of that ourselves. Is that something you've done in your work as a podcaster, writer, and cultural critic? If so, do you have any tips? Well, first of all, yes, I do try that. I have tried that. And second of all, I usually suck at it. So oh. just an example. I started writing a mystery a year or two ago, and I've yet to finish it, partly because I'm still trying to unravel how mystery writers write mysteries. And I keep reading mysteries, trying to figure out how did they do it? How did they lay the breadcrumbs? How did they, you know, lead me down a path so that I would follow them? And yeah. a lot of what I'm trying to do is, I think, you know, what young people frequently do when they're learning. I'm not a young person anymore, by the way. Uh, we just <laughs> copy. And so I'm trying yeah. to do a version of that where I'm kind of unraveling. I'm trying to copy, but I'm also trying to be careful not to really copy what they're doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, it's tough. I don't want to plagiarize. I just want to learn yeah. how they do it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not a very good student, apparently. <laughs> oh, no. I See, I, I so I want to recommend an episode of Working that I think is from last year, and that's when I talked with mystery writer Ellen Hart. She talked about taking apart a P.D. James mystery when she was working on her first mystery, and she had some good tips about oh. what she learned from doing that. So yeah, check that oh, out. Oh, I will definitely check that out. Yes. I was fascinated by Joshua's point that there are more books about magic than there are about stand-up comedy or a lot of performing arts that are objectively more popular than magic. And in that sense, he's absolutely right that magicians share their tricks. But you know, Kristen, part of me wonders if non-magicians really want to know how the illusionist sausage is made. I think many of us in the audience enjoy feeling that, you know what, we might actually be seeing something genuinely magical. I wonder if we really want to know how it was done. Do you want to know how they saw people in half or get a ring into a flashlight or whatever it was that he said that he has in his next show? You know, I'm divided on this question because on the one hand, I just want to believe that this beautiful 
craft, this thing mm. that was done for me, mm. that it can stand on its own. And I don't need to unravel it to enjoy it. Yeah. But I yeah. also, being perfectly honest with you, after watching many videos of Joshua, after each trick, I actually said audibly, I said it out loud, how did he do that? So there's <laughs> clearly a part of me that wants to know, how did he do that? So, you know, I think at the end of the day, it might be fun to learn how he did a couple of the tricks. And I have watched a couple of videos where he explains his tricks. Ooh. But knowing how he does a couple of his tricks, I think that's enough for me. Yeah. We'll have the, the sort of the air of mystery dispelled a little bit, but we'll leave some some unknowns in the world that's probably good for us yeah that's just about all the time we have this week we hope you've enjoyed the show if you have please remember to follow working wherever you get your podcasts then you will never miss an episode and just a reminder that by joining slip plus you'll get ad-free podcasts extra segments on shows like slow burn and you'll never hit a paywall on the slate site to learn more go to slate.com slash working plus Thank you to Joshua J and to our amazing producer, Cameron Drews, who performs magic in every single episode of Working. We'll be back next week with Ronald Young Jr.'s conversation with TV writer Mike Goyo. Until then, get back to work. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Grainger.com, or just stop by. Granger, For the ones who get it done.